got to find the other half of the boat over here. It's, uh, it's going to turn over if we aren't careful. But we do want to go to prayer at this time. And let me see. Brother Dane, would you please? Your Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, thank you for the time that you've given us to have a word of the Glad everybody's here. Who's visiting us for the very first time? Anybody? Yes, sir. Would you tell us who you are and where you're from? My name is Huey Hewitt. I live in Chile. We're glad to have you. Come back. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi, I'm Jay Hughes. All right. Well, we're just glad you're here. Go out and find who's missing and bring them back next Sunday or Wednesday night, preferably. Okay. All right. In the way of announcements, anybody? Yes, sir. Wednesday night business meeting. All right. Any other announcements? Where's he? There he is. <laughs> he went and snuck in on us, didn't he? <laughs> I gotta go get my glasses tomorrow anyway. I might explain part of it. All right, well, let's see. Let's do birthdays. Anybody had a birthday since we sang to you last? Anybody? All right, how about wedding anniversaries? <laughs> and my bride could not be here today. She's under the weather, but uh, 46 years today. Yeah. Well, you want to stand there? You want to get in here? We'll just pretend. I'm good that. right here. <laughs> and she is watching, I believe. Right. So. You're not going to see me, are you? I'm almost. <laughs> Politician, yeah. <laughs> you know, if my husband had lived uh, March the second, we would have been married sixty years. Sixty years. Ago. All right. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. Let me say happy anniversary, happy Susie. Anniversary. Yes, Susie, we don't know how you pulled it off. But... She robbed the cradle. Robbed the cradle. <laughs> All right. Well, on a more serious note, let's go to prayer request at this time. And uh, Jeff, tell us how BJ is doing. How about that? You tell her we certainly that way. So hopefully she's watching, so we, we miss you. Okay, and hurry up and we'll get back here. All right. So that's a special prayer for me. Uh, Miss Lucille told me is it Connie or Anna? Who did you say? That's my name. Cecilia. You said Miss Lucille. It sounded just wonderful. Well, if you hadn't made a big deal about it, why not? <laughs>
Tanya and Darlene Lincoln. She had asked me to do that, but I knew I couldn't do everything you just done. We'll see you. I'd like for everyone please remember my dad, Paul Richardson. Uh, as we know, he's had COVID uh, recently. He had a biopsy and his lung collapsed. Uh, stress fracture in his back, had a lot of health problems. And his health has gone down drastically. And the doctor recommended us calling hospice in. And so tomorrow morning we're gonna call hospice and probably bring him home. He wants to be at home. And so just be much in prayer for him. Special needs there. Susie doing a little bit better? Fair. Or anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Pray for my son in law. He's <clears throat> recovering from the flu. Uh, I'm going to have a very important birthday this coming week. My spiritual birthday. I'm 46 years old. Amen. She's not a poor set. Y'all remember this I is being recorded. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, it's, it's nice that even during such times when people are ill and, and everything, and we certainly need to remember the, the country of Ukraine and all that's going on there, but that we can find anything that we can have a little bit of uh, joy out of, uh, even if it's laughing at some of our own problems like not remembering names and those kind of things. But you know, uh, we have a God that um, can handle it all and he will he, in his way. So we won't go to prayer this time and uh Brother Calvin Here it is the Father. We just thank you for the opportunity to be able to pray for your house. Lord it's so good to see all these smiley faces and Lord we just give all the All right, let's all stand and sing 411 in the book, or you can look at the screen. <coughs> 411 in the book.
Lord, would you lead us in prayer, please? Dear Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We just thank you, Lord, for giving us this day. Lord, we ask that you just bless us all and now use it to put your work in. Bless your people. Thank you for the gift of salvation that you so freely gave. Amen. 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 for me on a hill called Calvary but there's something else I want to know does he still feel the nails every time I fail does he hear the crowd cry crucify again am I causing him pain then I know I've got to change I just can't bear the thought of hurting again it seems that I'm so at breaking promises and that I treat his precious grace so carelessly but each time he forgives oh what if he relives the agony he felt on that tree Every time I fail, does he hear the crowd cry, crucify again? Am I causing him pain? Then I know I've got to change. I just can't bear the thought of hurting him.
city of light where there cometh no night for the sun never sets in the sky in the bible we're told that the streets are pure gold and a cool gentle river runs by a joy to welcome you here today. Hope your week's been wonderful. Looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us on this day. In just a few minutes, we'll be turning to Revelation chapter 20, looking at verses 11 through 15. Going to discuss a little bit about the great white throne judgment and then also the difference between hell and the lake of fire, which it mentions in that scripture. 
And so if you'll find your place, we'll get there eventually. But let's begin in prayer. And before prayer, let me just say welcome to those watching us and at home or in the hospitals or wherever they may be uh, on Facebook Live. We appreciate you joining in with us this morning. The Lord says where we are gathered together in the midst of him, and that's wherever we are, he'll be there. We got some folks also in the fellowship hall. Let me say hello to you. We don't take you for granted. So glad that you could come and be a part of our service as well. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful, Lord, for what you are about to give us as we take it in. I pray that we'll digest it. And it would be beneficial to each and every one that is listening, whether it's here in the sanctuary, in the fellowship hall, or those watching us through Facebook Live. Or maybe later on in the week as they watch it being recorded and watch back then on YouTube, maybe. But Father, I pray that the scripture we'll be using today and the different ones we'll be bringing out and the message itself will be that which would help us in our daily walk. Father, we pray if there is one here or one listening that's without Christ, they would come to Jesus for salvation. That is the ultimate goal, is trying to reach people for Jesus before you return to take us home. So I pray this message touches every heart. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we live in a day when most people, if you would ask them, are you a good person? Most people would say, oh yeah, I'm a good person. I'm great. Everything's good with me. They think the way they live because they're a good person is also the basis for them getting into heaven. And that's not so. I believe we have a lot of good people that's going to end up in a place called hell. Because you don't go to heaven for being good. You don't go to hell for being bad. What makes the difference is if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. If you receive him or you reject him. You know, the, these people that says, well, I'm good, I'm all right. They reason in their minds, well, I, I know I'm not a saint, but at least I'm not a murderer. <laughs> Hang on there just a second. Maybe we need to look at the scripture before you make such a thought process in your mind. It says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, these words. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. But whosoever shall kill by, shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. The Bible teaches us that if we're angry without a cause, and don't y'all know some angry people out there? Seem like they get angry over any little thing. Well, the Bible says you're a murderer. So don't be so hasty to judge yourself as a good person. And at least you're a saint, but you never murder anybody. In light of your anger, you might have murdered a bunch of people. So be careful for that. These same people, they reason in their mind, well, I may look at a woman or I may look at a man, but at least I never committed adultery with them. Well, hold on a second there. Let's just look at what the scripture says. In Matthew 5, 27 and 28, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on on a woman to lust after her, have committed adultery with her already in his heart. In other words, it's not the physical act that causes adultery. The Bible teaches us when we look upon someone with lust in our hearts, we've committed adultery with them. That's the way Jesus looks at things. And yet these people think, well, I'm good. I'm, I'm not all that bad. I'm, I'm a pretty good person. And when they think of sinners, they never think of themselves in that category. No, I'm not a sinner. I'm, I'm a good person. I, I may not be perfect, but I'm a good person. But a sinner? No, I'm not a sinner. That's the way they reason in their minds. Sort of reminds me of the little boy who was in school, and he was doing poorly. And he took his report card home to his dad, and he come back to school the next day, and he very gravely, solemnly, and, and yet with some 
bravado, went to his teacher and said, I don't want to scare you, but my daddy said, if I don't get better grades, somebody's going to get a spanking. <laughs> he thought the teacher was at fault for his poor grades. And that's just the way a lot of people look at life. It's always somebody else's fault. I couldn't be at fault because I'm a good person. A lot of folks are just like that. But one day, God is going to set it all right. Amen. One day, there's going to be a payday. We've all heard it say there's a payday someday. Now, we've been going through the book of Revelation for quite some time now. And there are many topics we have touched on throughout the study of the book of Revelation. Uh, we examined the rapture in detail. We talked about uh, the coronation service, that service no one wants to miss out of chapter 4 and chapter 5. We've talked about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We've talked about the tribulation period. We've spoken about the 144,000 Jews and the two witnesses in detail. We've spoken on the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the great red dragon, which is Satan, who energizes them. We've spoken about the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the battle of Armageddon, the millennial reign, and that little season. We don't know how long it's going to be, but that's after the millennial reign. And now we come to the great white throne judgment out of Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Let's read that scripture. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now as we look at this scripture, every person who has ever died physically without Christ in their heart, their soul immediately goes to a place called hell. The body goes to the ground or the water to sea or cremation, but the body will resurrect one day and meet its soul as it is called out of hell before Jesus who will be the judge on the great white throne. And notice who it is that's there, the dead, small and great. No matter who it is, royalty or pauper, bad person or good person, if you've never accepted Jesus, they will find themselves at this judgment. Not one saved person will be here. Only those who never called upon Jesus for salvation. Notice the books were opened. The book of life. It is a common belief that every person ever born in this world has their name written in the book of life. It was Moses who gave us insight when he was trying to plead for the people of Israel, <clears throat> when he said, Lord, if you won't forgive them, then blot my name out of the book of life. So it's believed that every person born has their name written in the book of life, but upon death and they have failed to receive Jesus, their names are erased out, blotted out. Notice there's also another book open. It said the books were open. It's the book of life, and then also the book of works. These are the works of these individuals who never received Christ. They never called upon Jesus as their Lord and Savior. 
What works are we speaking of? I believe with all of my heart, it will be every deed, every word they've ever said, every action they've ever committed will be brought back before them but in front of Jesus as he opens the book and reads out their crime records. Never received Jesus will be the ultimate crime. Of course, many of these will say, but you never gave me a chance. And then he will also have in that book of record, well, your mama, she tried to get you to accept Jesus. You never would. Your daddy talked to you. Your sister, your brother, your wife, your husband, your friends, your Sunday school teacher, your preacher, and you turned them all down. And so all of this will be played back before each and every one that appears at the great white throne judgment. Notice it says, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Death and hell, the bodies and the souls come back together at the great white throne judgment. And they were judged every man according to their works. And after the judgment, Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There are two subjects we see here we need to clarify. One is hell. One is the lake of fire and brimstone. It is two different places. There are two completely different places. Hell is one, the lake of fire and brimstone is the other. Now, ladies and gentlemen, every one of us have been given another opportunity to hear the word of God. We've assembled ourselves together, either physically or virtually through Facebook, to listen to the word of God. And as the Holy Spirit leads us, come to the altar at the invitation and neither get saved or renew our relationship with him. For instance, if you're here and you're not saved, or you're watching and you're not saved this morning, when not, if you'll come to him for salvation, then not one single day of your life will matter where it concerns sin. It will all be wiped clean. That's a good deal. That's a good deal for everybody. To have all your sins erased, not one thing brought up. If you're here and you are saved and yet you're in a backslidden condition, you can come and renew your relationship with Christ and have your joy restored. Even David pleaded, restore the joy of my salvation. You know, there is no one any more miserable on this earth than a backslidden Christian. Amen. Huh? Amen. I do not preach on hell and the lake of fire simply to those of you who may be lost. We got a good deal of saved people who have no burden for the lost. And we need to know the difference between hell and the lake of fire and have that burden so we can share it with our loved ones and our friends so that they wouldn't have to come to an awful place called hell. The word hell has become an overused by word by many people in our world today. They use it so flippantly in their vocabulary and when they're talking. The Bible is plain in its declaration that hell is eternal. It never ends. And that is punishment by fire. In fact, Jesus spoke on hell many times. He said it was a place so terrible. It would be better to be deformed and blind than to go there. Listen to what Jesus said. Now, this is Jesus speaking in Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter a halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. 
And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, why is there even a hell to begin with? Well, hell is a place where God will deal righteously with the devil himself. In fact, listen to what it says in John 8, 44 concerning the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. We, we do realize that hell was not originally made for man. It was created for the devil and his angels. Listen to what it says in Matthew 25, 41. This is Jesus. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But because of men's refusal to accept Christ, and when I use the term man or men, I'm speaking of mankind. Just like the bride of Christ includes men and women. And so we're talking about mankind. Hell is where God will deal righteously with all of those who have rejected him for salvation. When man fell, speaking of Adam in the Garden of Eden, and then every man was born with a sin nature, he became subject to eternal judgment. Thus the wicked also go to hell. Listen to what John chapter 5 verse 28 and 29 says. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which that all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, and they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And they have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And yet some people still question, how can a loving God send people to a place called hell? And the answer really is very simple. God does it. God has given man a free choice, a free will. He doesn't make robots. He doesn't program us to follow him without a choice. He, he gives every one of us a choice to accept him or reject him, to live good or live bad, to go to heaven or go to hell. The choice and the decision is man and man's alone. God gets no pleasure from people dying and going to this place called hell. Now, people who go to hell, they must make a desperate effort to get there, if you think about it. They must walk over the caring death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary without any thought of what he did for us. In, in order to go to hell, people must push aside the love of Almighty God, which he provides for each and every one of us. For people to go to hell, they must be insensitive to the call of the Holy Spirit upon their heart as he pulls them to salvation. To go to hell, people must push past the prayers of all the righteous who have ever prayed for them. Family, friends, church, and, and then they must count as nothing the preaching of God's ministers or the teaching of God's Sunday school teachers. They must shut their eyes to the open doors of churches everywhere in order to go to hell. They must diminish the Holy Bible as a book of fables instead of being God's holy word. All good must be bypassed and all creation which loudly shouts of a great and a loving God must be ignored. God does not want anyone to have to go to a place called hell. He has provided a way of salvation, but he will not force us to accept that way. It's an open invitation. Come and receive. Yet there are some who declare there is no hell. It's just a figment of our imaginations. Hell remains for these a rude awakening at their death and at the day of judgment. Still other, even though they declare there's there's a hell, they don't think it's a place of fire. Christian science says hell is an era of the mortal mind. Jehovah's Witnesses say the wicked will simply be annihilated and then that's it, it's over. 
Mormonism says all will eventually be saved, but will not suffer eternal punishment. Seventh-day Adventists say God will someday blot out all sin and all sinners and establish a clean universe and the laws will be burned up just like a broom sage. But all of these are in error. These are all contrary to what the scriptures teach us. Much of what we know about hell, we learn from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He was the greatest hell and fire brimstone preacher that ever lived. And out of the many references of Bible uh, of the Bible of hell, 162 references, Jesus speaks 70 times concerning a place called hell. Why did Jesus speak so much on this subject? First of all, it's because he believed in the reality of this place called hell. He secondly warned man about hell because he did not want them to end up there. Listen to two verses that speak about God's desire for not wanting anybody to have to go to hell. They're very familiar scriptures. One is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The other is 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Notice that the word perish is in both scriptures. Should not perish. Any should not perish. Used in both of these scriptures speak of this place called hell and it's hellfire. To perish does not mean we simply quit existing. No, we're going to live right on and right on and right on whether we choose heaven or hell, whether we choose to accept Christ or reject Christ. When we die of physical death, it just don't end. We're going to continue. The place we're going to continue in is decided upon if we reject Jesus or not. To perish means that the one who has died without Jesus as their Savior will suffer the eternal torments of this place called hell. Now, I want it perfectly understood. I believe in hell. You'd be surprised at the amount of people that believe in heaven, but they don't believe in hell. They don't believe in hell. But just as sure as there's a heaven, there's a hell. Just as sure as there's a God, there's a devil. And the Bible speaks about the reality of this place. Let's spend a few moments looking in Luke chapter 16. In Luke 16, verses 19 through 31, the Bible tells us what makes hell a place of torment. It's not just the flames. It's not just the burning and the heat that makes hell a place of torment. Luke 16, beginning in verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now let's just stop right there for a minute. You have a saved man and a lost man. They both come to the end of their lives. One at the moment of death is carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Where, where is Abraham's bosom? Remember, this is before Jesus resurrected. So Abraham's bosom is in a place called paradise, the heart of the earth of which Jesus spoke about. It was in the center of the earth, the heart of the earth, and hell was an apartment just away from it. The rich man died and lifted up his eyes in hell. Immediately, he was in a place called hell. Now, we're going to get to this in a minute, but they could, they could uh, 
have these two compartments here and hell could look out, but heaven couldn't look in. That expression, Abraham's bosom turned his heaven. But look what he says in verse 23. In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. One of the torments of hell is they can see on what they're missing out on. He could see Lazarus being comforted in Abraham's bosom. He lifted up his eyes and looked out and saw what was taking place. He wasn't soul sleeping. There's a group of people out there that says that when you die, your soul goes to sleep until the rapture. Then you're taken up. That is not taught in the Bible. Paul says to be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. And so at the very moment of death, and as Jesus is speaking right here, Lazarus is alive. He's alert. He's awake. He knows what's going on. But those in hell, they're also not soul sleeping. They're alive. They're alert. They're, they see what's going on. And they have the torment of hell because they see what they're missing out on. Oh, if only I had accepted Jesus, I could be on the other side. I could be comforted. I could be receiving what Lazarus or that poor man is receiving. But no, I had to die without Jesus. He could see across the other side and see Abraham and Lazarus being comforted. He could see what he was missing out on. Now, can heaven look out into hell? The scriptures never speak of that. You'll not find one place in scripture where people in Abraham's bosom or paradise or heaven is looking into hell. It's like a two-way mirror. One of those reversible. You can look through one side and see what's going on the other side, but they on that side can't see you. That's heaven and hell. Hell can look and see what they're missing out on. That's one of the torments of hell. Knowing what they could have had, seeing it with their eyes, and missing out on it. But heaven, no. They can't see that. They're not going to look at that. Then notice what it says in verse 24. He could feel and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in his flame. He was thirsting. He was burning. He wanted just a drop of water because he felt the hellfire burning his soul, not his body. His soul was burning. It was burning. He was in torment. The flames of hellfire were burning his soul. And it's a fire that will never be quenched or never extinguish it. There will be no fire extinguishers, no water, not even the tears he was crying could put out the flames. That's one of the torments of hell is the physical feeling of burning and never stopping always on fire. Yes, hell is a place of weeping. How sad it is to see someone cry. One of the worst things we could ever do is See our mama cry or someone we love cry. And here on this earth, when our children cry or our wife cries or someone we love cries, we can console them. We can take a, a tissue and wipe their eyes and, and we can hug them and let them know we love them. But that's not going to be any of that going on in hell. None of that is offered to those who go to this place called hell. They, we're able to get away from the sorrowful faces when we walk away and somebody's crying and tears our heart out. But not so in hell, they'll be there forever. And everyone in hell will be weeping night and day. Listen to what Matthew 25, 30 says. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This speaks of excruciating pain. This speaks of the feeling knowing that they're going to be in torments for the rest of their life. Misery. And you know something? That rich man is still feeling the pain today. Jesus spoke this some 2,000 years ago, and he's still feeling it today. Still feeling the sorrow of hell. Sorrow will prevail. No one to give a kind word. No one to brush away a tear. When you recall the greatest time of your sorrow in your life, whether it's the death of a loved one, the news of global disaster, the sickness of someone who is near and dear to your hearts, 
the mistreatment of an innocent child, the dissolvement of a marriage. When you recall all of these and you experience the sorrow that you went through and it recalls back in your mind, not even in the smallest degree can it compare to the sorrow of hell. Hell is a place of outer darkness for those who rejected the light of the world. But then notice verse 25. He could remember. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. The memory can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. The memory can bless you. The memory can curse you. He had not lost his memory of how he had lived. And he was told to remember how you could have ended up like this, but you chose to live for yourself instead of living for Christ. I believe all of those in hell, because of what the scripture teaches us, will remember all the opportunities they had to receive Christ and rejected everyone. And if you're here today and walk out lost, you'll remember this day for the rest of your life for eternity. <clears throat> Because you'll be recalled in this place called hell if you never call upon Jesus. He remembered living his life without mercy toward others. He remembered living his life without turning to Christ and all the opportunities given him to help other people. And he only lived for self. But then notice what verse 26 says. And beside all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from thence that you cannot neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. He was imprisoned, is what you might say. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, that hell has gates. He says the gates of hell shall not prevail. He also told Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now listen to what 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says. 2 Peter 2, 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment. So the angels are chained in darkness. Sound like a dungeon to me. There's gates, prison bars. Hell is not a place of partying. A lot of people say, I'm going to go to hell and have a party with all my friends. No, you're not. You're going to be in agony and torments. And you're not going to be with your friends having a party. You're going to be in solitary confinement in the torments of hell. And there's no possibility of parole. Once you're taken there, you're there. Until the great white throne judgment. Hell is a place of separation. Separated from your wife or your husband. Separated from your parents or grandparents, from your children or grandchildren. Separated from everyone you ever know if you never accept Jesus. But then notice what he does in verse 27 and 28. He begins to pray. And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would have sent him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Finally, finally, he began praying. But it was too late. It was to no avail. Once you die the physical death, there is no possibility of salvation after that, after that moment. And even in hell, when he began to pray, it would do him no good. There's no mercy available once we die of physical death. But then notice what happens in verse 29 and 30. He begins to lead. He says, Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither would they be persuaded, 
though one rose from the dead. He began pleading. He knew it was too late for him. Knew there was no mercy for him. But he said, please send somebody to my relatives. Send somebody to tell them about Jesus where they won't have to come to this awful place. Hell was pleading for people to get saved. And what are we doing? How are we doing? If they could, all hell would beg for you that's lost to receive Jesus. Don't go to that place that they're in. You know, I, I see some things happening in hell. I wish this happened more in the church. Huh? Well, there's genuine faith. There's genuine faith expressed itself through this man in hell. There's a heartfelt sorrow for sin in hell. There's prayer going on in hell. And there's a burden for lost souls in this place called hell. I believe if church members were actually burdened for lost souls, we would see the church pews filled up every service. We would see the altars filled up at the end of every service. Listen, hell is a holding cell until the great white throne judgment. Once again, in 20, chapter 20 of Revelation, verses 11 through 15, the souls and the bodies of all of those who died lost without Christ resurrect the second resurrection and find themselves before Jesus Christ, the judge who sits upon the throne at the great white throne judgment. And when they stand there, they are rendered their sentence from the bench. It is pronounced death. Death. The lake of fire and second death of Revelation 20 14 are identical terms and used of the eternal state of all the wicked who die without Christ. It's not just a physical death, it's the second death. And that means eternal separation from God. Banished for all eternity. This is a death where there's no dying. It's simply existing without truly living for all eternity. Imagine the horror of Jesus uttering the words that would send an individual away for all eternity. Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. And it's so terrible. Imagine living your life the way you've always wanted to live without giving one thought to eternity. <clears throat> I'm reminded of a song I sung many years ago. In fact, I was a young man then. And the song was called Plenty of Time. This young man went through life just spending life like well, I got plenty of time. I'll accept Jesus later. Plenty of time got Jesus later. One day he found himself in a place called hell. He died without ever accepting Jesus. And now he had nothing but plenty of time for all eternity. Perhaps what would be equal to the horror would be a religious person, a church member even, a regular attendee of the Lord's worship services and stand before Jesus and hear him speak these words. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That passage of scripture found out of Matthew 7, 21 through 23, lets us know that not everyone who says they're saved is saved. Everyone who joins the church is not born again by the blood of the Lamb. 
Many who worked in ministries throughout the years were going to find themselves in a place called hell at the great white throne judgment even. And then Jesus is going to say, you might have preached, you might have taught Sunday school, you might have sung in the choir, you might have worked with the youth, but it was all for your own glory, not for my glory. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That's going to be an awful time to think you're all right. I'm good. I'm all right. Nothing's wrong in my life. But you see what we do? We judge ourselves based on what other people do. Well, I know I'm better than Albert, so I'm all right. I know I'm better than Michael, so I'm all right. That's what we do. But let me tell you who you need to judge yourself off of. That's Jesus. Amen. Let me see how you compare to Jesus before you start saying, I'm all right. I'm pretty good. I'm a good person. If you are so unfortunate as to enter into the lake of fire and brimstone, the Bible gives a list of who your neighbors are going to be. Revelation 21, 8 says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Which is the second death. I think what we discussed today is the most horrific scene that is mentioned in the Bible. The concept of people perishing forever in the torments of hellfire. Being banished to the lake of fire and brimstone. If you're here today, if you're watching us through Facebook Live and you've never been saved, well, while you still have breath in your body, you can. You can receive Christ if you'll come to Him today. If you'll trust Him by faith, your name will not be blotted out if you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you are saved, but you're not living where you ought to be, well, you can rededicate your life. You don't need to get saved again and saved years down the road again and saved again. You don't get saved but one time. Jesus died once for all sin for all time. But we may need to rededicate ourselves where we backslide. You remember when Jesus was walking, washing the disciples' feet and he come to Peter and Peter withdrew his feet and said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. You, you, you're the master and I'm the servant. I can't allow you. Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you'll have no part with me. Jesus, Peter stuck his feet out and his hands out and said, wash everything, Lord. <laughs> Here's what Jesus said. He that is washed need not wash again, just only the uncomely parts. And what does that mean? You take a shower at night. You, you got your duds on for the rest of the evening. You may walk outside and grab the paper, grab the mail, or may go outside just to see what's going on with the cat or the dog or the, what, what the neighbors are yelling at. And you walk back in, you may need to wash the bottom of your feet off, but you don't need to take a shower again. Jesus says once you get saved, you're saved. But you may need to rededicate your life because like David, you've lost the joy of your salvation. David said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He didn't say restore to me salvation. Restore the joy of my salvation. You see, if you're backslidden, you're definitely not going to be happy about it. You're going to be miserable. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To those of us who are saved, we've been reminded once again of our responsibility to let people know there's a place called hell that people will end up in if they don't receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Then remind them there's a place called heaven that if you accept Jesus, he has promised to all of those who trust in him. It ought to stir our hearts to be about the Father's business, to win in the loss for Christ. 
Let me say this in closing. If you have no recollection of any time in your life when you accepted Christ, you're probably not saved. I've talked to a lot of people, asked them, are you saved? Oh yeah, I'm saved. When did you get saved? And they cannot recall. They don't know. You may not remember the date. But if you ever got saved, I believe with all my heart, you'll remember the experience. Amen. Because you were there. You were there and Jesus was there. And so if you've ever gotten saved, you'll remember the experience and you'll know it in your heart. So today I plead with you. If you can't recall a time in your life where you called on Jesus, call on him today. Call on him today. Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to this time of invitation, I pray, Lord, as you have touched our hearts, that we would respond and we would pray according to your Holy Spirit's leading. If anyone here is lost without Christ or listening in, lost without Jesus in their hearts, I pray that this would be the day they'll come to Jesus for salvation. Father, no one needs to have to go to that place called hell. You have made every opportunity available. You've done everything that has been needed to be done for people to go to heaven to receive your son for salvation. But you will not force them. You plead with them to come. I pray this will be the day they'll accept Jesus. If we're backslid, not where we ought to be, I pray that we will come and receive Jesus once again, not as for salvation, but in the joy of our salvation. You'll forgive us of our sin, our trespasses. And then Lord, help us when we pray concerning the burden we have for our loved ones and neighbors and our friends who are still lost without Christ. I pray, Lord, you will give them that opportunity to receive Jesus. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've heard the message. I plead with you how you respond in invitation. Let's all stand. Comments or any testimonies you like to share with us to close out. God bless you. Hope you have a wonderful day. And, uh, just, yeah, have the opportunity to share Jesus with somebody. Hearts and minds clear. Brother Jeff, it's so good to have you with us. Would you close us in prayer today?